Um, welcome everyone to the uh, to the the, the Schumpeter lecture session. Um, a wonderful thing has happened to economics over the past decade, and that's putting inequality front and center. And the person res most responsible for that for this change is Thomas Piketty. So um, we're very uh, privileged and thrilled to have Thomas uh, here uh, this evening. And we know from surveys of thousands of students around the world each year that we've done since 2014, that when they're asked what's the most pressing problem economists should be addressing, the answer is inequality. And Capital in the 21st century, uh, uh, published in 2014 in English, captured the imagination of a much broader public than any other economics book, certainly in my lifetime. Why that particular book, that particular book of Thomas, was the global bestseller is not completely clear, just as it's not clear why Occupy and its We Are the 99% slogan was the one that caught on and became a worldwide movement in 2011. But they did, and the world is a different place as a result. The book established new facts about long run trends in income and wealth inequality for a group of high income countries that overturned Kuznets's comforting finding that rising inequality um, that, that, that accompanies economic development is then reversed. So it just goes down again. Um, it showed that capitalism succeeded defined by historically unprecedented growth of productivity and, and capital accumulation, most spectacularly in the post-war 20th century when within country inequality fell. Okay, so that's the second thing. The third is that it argued that the dynamics of capitalism itself in the form it exists in, in the 21st century would produce yet more concentration of wealth not as a result of meritocratic inequality, but arising from booming capital incomes as entrepreneurs become rentiers, and that as a result, radical policy action is needed to mitigate the injustices and other pathologies associated with it. So uh, when I mentioned that, that when we ask students around the world what they think we, we should be working on, then it's inequality. Uh, uh, but Tom, Tom has argued that their second ranked uh, theme, the climate crisis, uh, can likely not, not be combated unless existing levels of global inequality are reduced. He's also said, uh, I think economists sometimes spend too much time doing very sophisticated theory without knowing what the facts they're trying to explain and understand. So he's going to, what we're going to get today are the facts. We're going to get the facts on global inequality, new facts uncovered and systematized by him and this extraordinary uh, group of collaborators in the World Inequality Database Project. There wasn't much on the low income world in capital in the 21st century. And the new work fills that gap and covers data from all over the world. So what has happened to global inequality, income inequality in the past 200 years? Thomas, with great pleasure and anticipation, I invite you to deliver the 2021 EEA Schumpeter Lecture. So Thomas, take it away. And everyone else, there will be time for live questions and answers afterwards. Okay, thanks a lot, Wendy. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me now or if I have been unmuted, that's good. So, uh, you know, I'm very grateful to the European Economic Association for uh, asking me to deliver this very uh, prestigious le lecture. And, and thanks a lot, Wendy, for this kind words of introduction. So the title of this lecture is going to be the following, Global Income Inequality 1820-2020 the persistence and mutation of extreme inequality. So what's going to be new in this lecture is really the global perspective. So, you know, we've been working with a large group of uh, friends and scholars, uh, Emmanuel Says, Gabriel Zuckman, uh, Facundo Alvarado, 
you know, dozens of people across countries and across world regions on, on the country level and regional level inequality for a long time. And, and now, you know, it's, it's possible sort of to put together all these country level findings to look at the uh, evolution of global income inequality, so between world citizens, between world inhabitants. And so this is the novel part of, the, of this uh, paper and findings that I'm going to present. I should say that this uh, presentation comes from a joint work with Lucas Chancel, who is a co-director of the World Inequality Lab in Paris. And, and, uh, and so everything I'm going to say comes from this joint uh, research. So let me, let me start right away. So uh, the... Uh, uh, yeah, for some reason, yeah. Oop, no, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, let let me start right away by describing, you know, what the the new uh, estimates are and what the, the you know what our main results are, are going to be and what I'm going to stress uh, in this uh, in this presentation. So this is. You know, the, the, the main results, probably the, to me, the most striking result is really the persistence of a very high level of, of inequality, what we call here a very uh, highly hierarchical world economic system uh, over a very long period of time. Uh, so just to give you some orders of magnitude uh, of what we're going to find, you know, the global top 10% income share uh, uh, has oscillated around 50-60% of total world income over 1820-2020, whereas the bottom 50% income share uh, has been around 5-10%. Uh, if you if you want, so the, so the top 10% share has been typically, you know, 10 times bigger sometimes, or, you know, 5 to 10 times bigger than the bottom 50% share, in spite of the fact, of course, that the bottom 50% by construction is five times more numerous than the top 10%. And another order of magnitude maybe to remember is that the, the share of world income going to the bottom 50% has typically been of the same order of magnitude as the share of Top global income going to the top 0.1% share. So that's, you know, that's, that, so that's pretty extreme. Now, in, in terms of, if we were looking at the inequality of wealth, you know, what people own rather than what people earn during a given year, it will be even more extreme. Uh, but of course, you know, the difference is that you can somehow, you can live without wealth, you know, as long as you have sufficient income to uh, consume and, and, and take care of your family and, and people you care about, you know, it's, it's okay to have no wealth. If you don't have uh, income, uh, you know, that's, of course, that's more difficult. So, so this kind of very extreme level of income inequality, uh, you know, is, is quite striking. To give you a comparison, you know, the level of global inequality is close to the uh, country level observed in South Africa, which is the sort of highest inequality point in the world in our, in our database. Uh, so that, you know, in that sense, this is really pretty extreme. The second finding is that we see a marked increase of global inequality between 1820-1910, uh, especially because during this period, uh, which was also the period of uh, colonial empires and, and rise of the West and, and industrial revolution, uh, you know, be, between, both between and within country inequality were rising, and in particular between inequality was rising. Within inequality was very high, throughout this period and it was rising somewhat but but most importantly between inequality was rising so total world inequality was rising very fast then you have a second period you know if we take a very long term perspective which is between 1910 and 2020 and somehow we, what we find is that global inequality over this period sort of stabilized at a very high level which doesn't mean that nothing happens you know as we will see you know this stabilization is sort of the the, the consequences of a, a, a large number of contradictory evolution. So in particular, uh, what we will see is that between and within inequality follow uh, uh, diverging trajectories over this period. So basically between 1910 and 1920, and between 1910 and 1980, uh, you have a decline in within country inequality, but a rise of between country inequality. And then between 1980 and 2020, you have the opposite. And what, what we will stress, so this 
this is, as Wendy was saying, you know, this is mostly an empirical paper, but you know, of course, we will we will discuss some of the interpretation for the for these findings. But you know, we certainly don't pretend that the, the data we put together in this research is uh, sufficient to come with a perfectly uh, satisfactory explanation for everything we find. Uh, but but still, you know, we discuss a number of alternative explanations, and we 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 want really to stress that different policy, uh, different institutional environment, uh, you know, could have led to different trajectories. So, you know, there's nothing uh, sort of deterministic, you know, there's no economic determinism in this trajectory. And, and that's, of course, very important for the, for the discussion for the, for the future. Uh, before I, I show you the findings in more details, let me uh, um, talk about the relation to existing literature. So let me make clear that, you know, everything we, we are doing in this research and everything I have been doing in my research for the past, uh, you know, 20 or almost 30 years already, I can't, I can't believe that I'm already so old, but apparently. Uh, uh, so everything I've been, I've been doing, you know, is really sort of building upon the work of others and sort of continuing a tradition of uh, you know, accumulation of knowledge and, and income distribution. So the, the modern literature on, on historical trends and inequality really starts with Kuznets in 1953, who was the first author of uh, national accounts for the US. You know, he computed the first series for national income in the interwar period in the US. And his next big task was to use uh, the income tax uh, data for the US in order to compute the evolution of the top 10% income share and the bottom 90% income share. So in effect, uh, dividing national income uh, across fractal in the distribution. Now, this has been followed, you know, Atkinson and Harrison in 1978 have written a wonderful book on, on wealth inequality in the UK, which, which I recommend very, very strongly. And, and then sort of, you know, I, I took up a little bit this tradition looking at the case of France in 2001, then with Emmanuel Saez, we looked at the case of the US in 2003, with Tony Atkinson, um, we, we uh, uh, put together two big volumes in 2007-2010, putting together a large number of countries, mostly in the Western world, but trying in the 2010 volume to look at India, to look at uh, uh, you know, a number of countries outside the, the, the West. Uh, we, we continued this, this uh, effort to expand our world coverage uh, with the publication of the World Inequality Report in 2018. We, uh, constructed new inequality series for India, China, Russia, Latin America. If you want to know, you know, all the details about the country studies, you should go to the World Inequality Database website, you know, wid.world, where you will have the full details. In particular, you will find uh, uh, what we call the DINA guidelines, DINA for Distributional National Accounts Guideline, which we published in 2020, where we sort of set uh, the, the, the general methodology that we use in order to combine in a systematic manner uh, uh, survey data, tax data, national accounts, uh, wealth rankings, uh, inheritance data, wealth data. So, you know, we, we really, you know, there is no perfect data source to study inequality. Probably there's no perfect data source to study anything. So what you need to do is to combine data sources in a consistent manner. And, and this is, you know, what we do in the DINA guidelines to measure the distribution of income and the distribution of wealth. Although today my, my talk will be limited to the distribution of income from the very bottom to the very top. And the general objective, uh, you know, is to be able, what we are trying to do now is to publish on the, on the website every year a new uh, 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 distributional estimates for, for uh, pretty much all countries uh, in the world. Now, the novelty of the present research is that we're going to go back through time. You know, at, at, at this stage, uh, the World Inequality Database starts in 1980 for most countries in the world, and then for a limited number of countries, uh, mostly rich Western countries, uh, sometimes some, some a number of, of non-Western countries as well. We start in 1900, 1910, sometime in the 19th century. The novelty of the present research is we try to expand the historical coverage of the database uh, uh, and in a global manner. Uh, uh, and, and that's, you know, this is what's, what's new. 
Now we are not the, we are certainly not the first one to try you know this kind of global inequality exercise. So so again, what I mean by global inequality is that we are going to try to put all the country level distribution of income together uh, as if the world was a single country and looking at each individual of the world as one data point, one individual and looking at the percentile of this global distribution of income. So, you know, the bottom 50% of the world, the top 10% of the world and look at how the inequality of the distribution has, has changed over time. Uh, so, some other people did that in the past, in particular so, the, of course, the, the work by Madison on national, historical national account you know, has been very uh, uh, influential in this area and we rely a lot on, on, on some of the uh, national account series built by Madison, although we, we, for a number of countries we have uh, refined estimates that we, that we prefer to the series of Madison, but for, for the most part we really rely a lot on, on Madison and the Madison project which is currently updating the Madison series. The, one work uh, that sort of put together the, the aggregate uh, uh, national income and population series of medicine together with income distribution series in order to compute global distribution estimate is a paper by Bourguignon and Morrison that was published in the American Economic Review in 2002. So what we do in a way is very close to to, to, uh, to, uh, to Bourguignon and Morrison. And, and, and in many ways, we find similar results for the 19th century with the rising inequality trend at the global level. And the 20th century, where you have a mixture of stabilization and, and contradictory movement. So what's new in this work as compared to Bourguignon and Morrison is first, when, we, we, when Bourguignon and Morrison stopped in 1992, and we are in 2021, so we can add almost 30 years of data. So that's that's important because a lot happened in the past 30 years, uh, and and in particular with the rise of China, and sort of it's, it's very interesting to put in in historical perspective what happened in the in the past 30 years. The other uh, difference with Bourguignon Morrison is that we uh, Bourguignon Morrison did their work sort of before the new wave of historical research on inequality series really started. So they, in effect, they, what they, you know, they did very simple assumptions for income distribution in the past. And most of the time, they just assume uh, uh, constant distribution in the past. And so mo most of their conclusion come from the evolution of between country inequality in average income. Uh, whereas we use, we are able to use the new wave of historical research on inequality series, which lead to more precise estimates. You know, I, 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 we should be very modest. I mean, our estimates are still very unsatisfactory, very unprecise, but I, I think at least they are a bit better than what we had before. Uh, uh, and one of the consequences of this, of, this, uh, of this novelty is that our results typically lead to higher inequality levels, more amplitude in inequality shift, uh, uh, because uh, well, you know, the recent literature using historical tax data typically leads to uh, higher top income shares and the, the, the literature, that, the previous literature that was only using survey data. So this, you know, this has some consequences on the total level of inequality and, you know, for some sub period, it has some consequences on the trend, uh, not necessarily over the very long run. Um, the, the, the main contribution is really to be able to extend the analysis over two centuries, you know, 1820 to 2020, uh, in order to quantify the mixture of within between country dynamics driving, in particular, recent global inequality trends. So, as I said, you know, looking at 1990 2020 is really key in order to be able to put the recent period of between country convergence into a broader historical perspective. You know, how important is you know, the, the, what happened in the past 30 years in terms of global income inequality as compared to previous trends? So this is what we're gonna try to, to, to answer. So just, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be very short on methodology and, and technical details. If you have questions, you know, I'd be happy to answer. You will find everything online. So, you know, here on this table, uh, you have a description of the, of the database in terms of regions, countries, years. Uh, uh, and if you go on the WeedWorld web website, you know, if you look at the, at the link that we give at the bottom of the table, you know, weed.world slash long run, you will find the full paper, technical appendix, computer code, you know, if you find any mistake in the computer code, please send us an email. 
you know, everything is online so that you know it can be discussed, improved. I, I will not get into the detail of the, of the computer code in this presentation, but you know, you, you can really have, have a look if you want. What, what's, what's, what I want you to remember about the database that we construct is that you know, we, we are not going to pretend that we can construct an annual uh, database for the 19th century for all uh, you know, 200 countries in the world. You know, this will be uh, meaningless. So we have annual series for all countries in the world starting in, in pretty much all countries in the world starting in 1980 to 2020. This is already what's available in the uh, wide world, in the world inequality database. Uh, and what we do is uh, for the period between 1900 and 1970, we provide one estimate uh, uh, every 10 years, you know, 1900, 1910, 1920, up to 1970. And for the 19th century, we provide estimates for 1820, 1850, 1880, which we believe is more reasonable, you know, given our, the limited data source that we have for this period. So what do we, you know, for the 19th century, what you should have in mind is first, there is a number of countries where the income tax was introduced around uh, 1870, 1880, you know, in, in, uh, in Germany, or actually in, in most German states, uh, in Japan, in Denmark, uh, in, you know, there's a number of, in, in, in US, UK, France, you know, it's more around uh, 1900, 1910, uh, but, but in a number of, of other Western countries, and in Japan, it was more uh, closer to 1870, 18. 80. Before 1870, we typically don't have income tax data, but we have a lot of inheritance tax data. So, for instance, for Britain, for France, for, for Sweden, for the US, we, we have relatively rich uh, uh, inheritance data. So, we have good estimates of the change in the, so the distribution of wealth between 1800 and 1870, from which we can make assumptions and estimates about the, the change in the distribution of, of uh, income. And I will show you robustness checks later, you know, showing that, you know, this is not going to have a, a major impact on our finding, even if we make uh, alternative assumptions. The other thing that I want you to remember is that we are not trying to cover every country in the world. So typically, we divide the world uh, into uh, nine big world regions, you know, East Asia, Europe, Latin America, Middle East, North Africa, North America, Oceania, which we sometimes put with North America, uh, Russia, Central Asia, South, Southeast Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And in, this, in each of these regions, there is a number of countries for which we have uh, country level, uh, we provide country level estimates, for instance, China and Japan in the case of East Asia. And then for the other countries, we only have a, 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 an aggregate uh, you know, for other East Asia. So this is for the period 1820 to 1970. Uh, starting in 1980, we have a series for, uh, for pretty much all. Uh, of Tom, I just, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but yeah. um, are you changing the slides? Because we can't see uh, them changing. Uh, right now, can you, see, what do you, what, what slide do you see? Uh, we see the slide number two. So we haven't seen any data yet. But do you see the slide written table one? No. Ah, maybe you should have told me earlier. So what's, so what's happening with the slides? Uh, yeah, sorry. I didn't know whether you were, yeah, that's table one. We see it perfectly now. But before that, you could not see it. No, now we ah, can okay. see table one. <laughs> so, 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 it's aware. so before that, you were still here? Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, so, sorry, so, so let me show very quickly the slides that you didn't see. So this was, you know, a description of the, of the literature. So, you know, I, I described, you know, the fact that the modern literature starting with Kuznets and we, you know, we continued the, this work with uh, Saez and Atkinson and, and we published, you know, these Diana guidelines online, which you will find on the Weed.world website. And so the novelty of this research is that we put together, you know, the Weed World series and expand, you know, the historical uh, global coverage of the, of the series. So this slide was on Bourguignon and Morrison, which I already discussed. Uh, 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 so basically, the, you know, major difference is that we go until 2020 and we rely on the new wave of historical research on inequality series, which Bruno and Morrison uh, could not rely upon. And finally, you know, when I was describing the database, basically everything I said uh, was based on this um, uh, table one, which you 
Uh, now see Wendy, yes? Yep, perfect. Okay, good. <laughs> and so I, as you can see, you know, the structure of the database is that it becomes annual in 1980. And before that, we only provide estimate for 1820, 1850, 1880, and then every 10 years between 1900 and 1970. And we provide estimates for uh, 33 individual countries. So for instance, China and Japan in the case of East Asia, and, and then sub-regions for, for, for the rest of each uh, region. Okay, so this is the basic structure of the database. Maybe to clarify, you know, what, what we are talking about. So when we talk about the world, in terms of population, you know, we all know we go from, uh, you know, in 1820, you have uh, about 1 billion uh, inhabitants in the world. Uh, today, you have 7.6 or 7.7 .7 billion inhabitants in the world. If you look at the composition of the world population, you know, of course, you have all these big changes that we, uh, uh, that we all know very well. Let me maybe stress that the share of China in the world population was particularly big. In 1820, you know, before the, the big loss of population following the big war in, in China during the Taiping Revolt, and you know, there was a big drop in the population of China in 1850, 1870. Uh, uh, so the share of China in world population was particularly big in 1820. You know, otherwise, you know, I think all the, the numbers are pretty pretty familiar. Uh, uh, so this is for global, you know, the structure of global population. Uh, this is the structure of global average income. So, you know, if you take in 2020, if you divide a global national income of a global income of the entire world by total population, you get an average income of 11,000 uh, euros, you know, in purchasing power parity. So that's about, if you want, you know, around 1,000 euros per month, you know, will be the average income of all inhabitants of the world, adults of children, today. Uh, now, of course, the average income of each country uh, can vary a lot. So you can see that China now uh, is a little bit above world average, you know, 109% of world average in 2020, as compared to 20% of world average of 1980. In 1980. So of course, this is a huge uh, change. Uh, 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 and, you know, you have this, the same results for the different countries. So again, you know, here there's nothing particularly new. It comes mostly from the, from the Madison series, which we have updated and refined in a number of cases. What, what you have here is, is something that is very well known, is that the gap between the West and the rest of the world widened a lot between 1820 and 1950 or actually 1980, and then started to reduce uh, you know, between 1980 and 2020. So let me now, show you the first sort of big results. You know, if we put together uh, uh, our estimates for the distribution of income in the different countries and our data on average income and total population per country, what do we get for the global income inequality? So this is sort of the first big descriptive graph. So what you can see is that the, the top 10% of the world uh, typically has between 50 and 60 percent of total income. You see an increase between 1820 and around 1900. And then, you know, between 1900 and 2020, it sort of fluctuates between 60 and 55 percent, you know, with no, with no clear trend. In fact, if you look at the entire period 1820-2020, what's quite striking is that there's limited change in the end. I mean, there's rising inequality somewhat between 1820 and 1900, uh, but then it sort of stabilizes. Uh, if you look at the bottom 50% share, you can see a decline, you know, from 1820, pretty much until 1980. Then you have an increase between 1980 to 2020, but as you can see, it's still, you know, it's still very small. You know, like today the bottom 50% share will be 7% of total income, which is still, uh, you know, uh, less than, than 1900 and, and much less than 1820. Uh, now, if we want to go a bit further than just this, this basic decomposition, uh, what you can use, you know, let, let, if we want to talk, if we want to look at, we want to look at different inequality indicators. What can we think? What, what indicators? You know, I'm going to show you the Gini coefficient in one second, and the evolution will be very similar. In, you know, I, I tend to prefer, you know, this kind of 
ratio uh, indicators, which in a way are more sort of intuitive to grasp on the Gini coefficient. So here, this, I look at the ratio between the average income of the top 10% and the average income of the bottom 50%. Uh, so in 1820, the average income of the global top 10% is 18 times higher than average income of the bottom 50%. In 1910, the ratio is uh, up to 41. In 1980, it's up to 53, which is the highest point in, with this indicator, the highest point for global inequality. And then in 2020, it's, it's, uh, it's down to 38, which is very close to the 41 we have in, uh, in 1910. So, you know, if, if you take this inequality indicator, you know, you have a clear rise of inequality uh, uh, from 1820 to 1900, and then, uh, you know, sort of contradictory movement and sort of stabilization between 1900 to 2020. Uh, if you look at the Gini coefficient, you know, it's very, it's relatively close uh, in the sense that, you know, the Gini coefficient goes uh, from uh, 0.60 to 0.72 between 1820 and 1910. And then it's again 0.72 in 2000. It, it declined significantly to 0.67 in 2020, but, you know, it's still close to 1880 or 1890 uh, and, and much higher than, than 1820. Now, this is probably the, mo the most important graph for our finding. You know, this is the decomposition between between country and within country inequality. So what you have here is, uh, uh, so the way we compute, uh, uh, let's start with between country inequalities, which is uh, the graph, you know, the, the, the line in orange. The way we compute between country inequality, so here we, we take the same indicator, you know, this ratio T10 divided by B50, which is this ratio between the top 10, the average income of the top 10% and the average income of the bottom 50%. Um, uh, and for the between country inequality ratio, the way we proceed is we assume that everybody in a given country has the same uh, average income as the average income uh, of the country. So we, we sort of uh, uh, take away entirely the within country inequality component. We assume there's full equality within each country, within China, within the US, within France, etc. And then we compute, you know, the global uh, uh, income inequality making this assumption. And when you do that, you can see that between country inequality, you know, increased enormously uh, between 1820 and 1980, uh, and then declined significantly between 1980 and 2020. Now that's due partly to, to, uh, to, to China, but it's, it's not only due to China, because in fact, at the end of the period, China is not anymore in the bottom 50% uh, of the world. So it's also due to the big growth, uh, relatively large growth in, uh, in Indonesia, in, in India, in, uh, in, uh, in a number of African countries, also not all, uh, in Vietnam, in a number of South Asia countries. So, so that's, that's uh, you know, that's a relatively big decline uh, of between country inequality. In the, in, the, in the recent period. Now, if you look at within country inequality, uh, uh, so this is the, 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 the line in blue, the way it was computed was by doing basically the opposite computation. So basically we, we uh, 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 assumed away all the between inequality component by assuming that each country has the same average income so we rescale the income of, of the country so that each country has the same average income. We use the full distribution for each country and we compute, you know, the inequality of the world distribution under this assumption. So it's, it's sort of equivalent to have, to have a simple uh, average weighted by population for the, for the inequality uh, in, 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 each, uh, in each country. And what we find is that you have a rise of inequality between 1820 and 19. Uh, 100, uh, 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 small rise, but starting from a very high level of inequality. We have a decline between 1900, 1980, especially 1910, 1980. So this is, you know, largely due to World War One, World War Two, and all, and most importantly, all the change in social and fiscal policies that happened after World War One and World War Two, rise in social security, uh, progressive taxation. So these are issues on which I have 
I have written uh, quite a lot. And then starting in 1980, uh, you have an increase in inequality, which in my view is largely due to a reverse change in, in policies and institutions since uh, uh, 1980s, you know, for all sorts of political and ideological reasons, which I'm not going to talk uh, too much uh, about today, but you know, which of course there will be a lot to say. But, our focus here in this paper is that basically, you know, we, we sort of knew there was a decline in, in, in between country inequality, of course, we knew there was an increase in within country inequality. What's, what I think we didn't fully know is that when we put everything together, in the end, we have a sort of stabilization, you know, the, you know, the global ratio between uh, T10 and B50, and it's uh, very close for other inequality indicators. So what we see on this graph as a sort of stability, uh, in fact, is, is not really a stability. It is the consequences of contradictory movement. So between 19, 1910 and 1980, uh, between inequalities rising within is declining. And between 1980 and 2020, it is the, the opposite. And, and in, in, our, you know, in my view, very much due to, to different uh, policies, both at the national and international uh, level, and I will come back to this a bit later. So we could also do this decomposition using the tail index, you know, which is another inequality indicator, which in fact, one of the main properties of the tail index is that you can do this kind of multiplicative uh, um, or additive decomposition in a, in a very nice manner, and, and the, the two components nicely add up to total inequality, and we get, you know, similar uh, similar conclusion. Although, you know, again, I, I sort of prefer to do it with this ratio, which I think are more uh, sort of more intuitive way to, to measure inequality. And another result that I want to stress, which I mentioned at the beginning, is that, you know, I said, you know, the bottom 50% share is really very small. Uh, uh, and one way to see it is to compare, you know, in this figure, I compare the bottom 50% share to the top 1% and the um, uh, top 0.1% uh, share. So, you know, the top 1% share, you know, uh, in, you know, is typically around 20% today, you know, 20, 22% today, uh, uh, whereas the bottom 50% share is, is, uh, is between 5 and 10%. So, you know, the share of total income going to the top 1% is much bigger than the share of income going to the bottom 50%, which also means that, you know, when we talk about the right level for the top 1%, you know, it's, not, it's much more than about uh, symbolic uh, issues. You know, we are talking about big money and, and you know, which uh, you know, can have major consequences for world poverty, for instance, and you know, the resources available to invest in education and health and income support for the bottom uh, 50%. This is not at all negligible. Uh, if, if, you, if you go higher up, you know, say the top 0.1%, then you, you, know, you can see that the top 0.1% share is typically of the same order of magnitude as the bottom, uh, as the bottom, bottom 50% uh, uh, share. You know, by the way, you know, Wendy mentioned, uh, uh, you know, the environment in her uh, introduction. Let me say that when we look at the distribution of carbon uh, emissions, which is something we have done also with Luca Chancel and, and that Luca recently uh, extended, we typically have the same uh, the same orders of magnitude. So typically, you know, the the the, the, the top one percent share in global emission will be, uh, you know. Well, not exactly 20 percent, maybe 15 to 20 percent, but which is which will be you know at least two times as large or three times as large as the emissions of the bottom 50 percent of the world, you know, which are typically people in, in South Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa, which actually are going to suffer from the consequences of global warming coming from the emission of the top one percent. So this kind of orders of magnitude that I show you here, you know, are, are actually not very different for for for. Uh, for global uh, global carbon emission. Uh, okay, I could show you other uh, indicators, you know, like the, the T1 B50 ratio, but I want to to uh, to speed up a little bit. Uh, if you, if you look at the top one B50 ratio, you will see that you know the the level the the, the highest inequality level, you know, was actually uh, both in, in in history was in at the eve of World War One, you know, 1910, and at the eve of the 
global financial crisis of 2008. So you know, in 2007, this ratio was actually even a bit higher than 1910, or similar to the level that we had before, uh, before World War I. If we look at the top 0-1 to B50 ratio, then, in fact, the level of 1910 has never been uh, fully, uh, fully uh, attained uh, since then, which shows that, you know, this, is, this mostly reflects the very, very high level that there was, especially in European societies uh, uh, before, uh, before World War I. Uh, okay, let me, let me move on a little bit. Uh, you know, when, when you look at the ratio like T1, B50 or T10, B50, you know, it's also interesting to decompose, say, between uh, T1, M40, so M40 is the middle 40%, you know, the people who are not in bottom 50% and people who are not in the top 1% uh, percent or top 10%. What, if you do this kind of decomposition, what's very striking in the recent period is that you have sort of an increase in inequality in the upper half of the distribution. So the ratio between T1 and M40 has been rising and a decline of inequality in the, in the bottom part of the distribution in the sense that the gap between M40 and B50 has been declining. Another way to look at this, which is exactly the same thing, is the well-known uh, elephant curve, you know, which was first proposed by uh, uh, Branko Milanovic and which we have uh, followed uh, in the World Inequality Database and which we we have very much uh, confirmed. And, and so here, what you have on this curve is, you know, you rank individuals in terms of percentiles of the global distribution of per capita uh, uh, real income in 1980. And you look at the total cumulated real growth between uh, 1980 and 2020. What you see is that, you know, the biggest growth performance has been both in the bottom and at the very top. Uh, and, and so that's, that's, that's interesting because this means that if you only look at uh, uh, an aggregate uh, inequality indicator like the Gini coefficient or actually the T10 divided by B50 ratio, you will have the illusion that you know, this ratio is sort of stable or maybe declined a little bit. Uh, but in fact, it's not stable at all. You know, if, it was, if, if the distribution was stable, this curve, this red curve on this graph should be completely flat. And as you can see, it is very far from flat. So you really have two contradictory movements. I already talked about the contradictory movement of between and within country inequality. But here there's another two contradictory movement, which is you have a, a, a decline of inequality in the, in the bottom. Of the bottom is getting closer to the middle, and you have an increase of inequality in the top, uh, uh, which is getting further away from the from the, from the middle. Uh, you can, if you, if you look for the, the, the same growth incidence curve over the full period 1820-2020, then what you get is that there's actually much bigger income growth for the top 30% of the world and from bottom 50%. You know, this is simply another way of saying what I already told you before, which is that the inequality level uh, uh, today and actually between 1910 and 2020 are bigger than in the 19th century. We can also do the regional decomposition by country. So here this is, uh, you know, the regional decomposition for the top 10%. So you can see that, you know, Today, you know, you can see the rise of China between 1980 and 2020. So, you know, back in 1950, there was al almost nobody from China or Japan in the, in the top 10% of the world. And, and, you know, today you see, you see the big rise. This is a bit due to Japan at the beginning, you know, in 1960, 70, but this is mostly due to, to China uh, at the end of the period. But you can also see that Europe and, and North America, you know, are still the biggest component, of course, of the, of the top 10%. I mean, you have some people from the Middle East, some people from Latin America. That's even clearer if you look at the top 1%, you can see that, you know, uh, Middle East and North America, uh, uh, or, uh, or actually Russia, uh, have a bigger share than in the top 10%. So this reflects the fact that the Middle East, Latin America, Russia are very unequal, relatively more unequal than Europe. Or, US, so they are, actually, they, they are sort of stronger in the global top 1% than in the global top 10%. Uh, 
uh, for, for China, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's relatively close. Uh, you know, you, you can do the same. So there's almost nobody from Africa, you know, in the top 10, global top 10% or global top 1%, you know, so it's, it's very, it's almost negligible. Uh, uh, now, if you look at the, at the bottom 50%, then, you know, uh, Africa is, 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 is getting a bigger and bigger share, but in terms of population, you know, Africa will grow bigger and bigger in the 21st century, but as of today, it's smaller than uh, South Asia and East Asia, and so South Asia in particular uh, uh, is the biggest component of the, of the bottom 50%. And, you know, in the, in the North, you have very few people uh, who are in the global uh, bottom 50%. Uh, if you look at the middle 40%, then, you know, it's much more balanced, you know, it's sort of closer to the, to the general distribution of the population in the, in the, in the data. Okay, we performed a number of robustness checks, you know, in, in, in particular different variants regarding the evolution of freezing country inequality between 18, 20, 19, 10. In practice, this has relatively little impact, you know, because as we've seen on figure four, which was the figure on within versus between country inequality, the really striking trend over the 18, 20, 19, 10 period is the rise of between country inequality. And so the small rise in within country within country inequality is not so important and, and doesn't play such a big role. So even if we, if it was flat before that, you know, it wouldn't make a big difference. So, so you know, in that sense, uh, you know, our findings are pretty uh, robust, uh, you know, so, you know, I show you here again this figure four, which is probably the most important thing. So, so the bottom line is the orange curve, you know, uh, the change in the orange curve is more important than the change in the blue curve uh, in the period 1820 to 1910. And the orange curve is relatively well measured. You know, this really corresponds to the rise of the West uh, uh, during, this, uh, during this period. Now, let me come to the, you know, the discussion uh, of our findings. Uh, now, you know, what, how can we account for this very large uh, and persistent level of inequality in income? Uh, the first thing you know, I would like to stress is that this is firstly due you know, to large inequality in productivity. So if we were doing the same uh, computation by with hourly income, so dividing the income of each country by, by average number of hours, global inequality would be even higher because on average uh, poor countries have uh, number of hours of work than rich countries. So this is first, you know, this is clearly a large, enormous inequality in productivity, which at some level, you know, if you believe a little bit in uh, standard, uh, uh, you know, growth theory and, and neoclassical economics, you know, must be due to, uh, to a big difference in capital and demand, you know, both human capital and physical capital. So then the key question is, you know, why doesn't capital flow to, to, you know, from rich to poor countries, which is of course a very old question, which many people have, have asked. You know, in principle, this will raise global output enormously and reduce global inequality uh, tremendously. Now, in reality, of course, the problem is that, you know, unless they are forced to do so, you know, the wealthiest groups are very unlikely to give up their wealth and capital for free. And, you know, they will, maybe they will lend uh, some of their resources uh, to the poorest countries, uh, but typically they want to remain in control and they want to be paid back and, and if possible to, to make you know, large, large profits, uh, which is going to complicate a lot, you know, this, this process of convergence, you know, between rich and poor countries, which, you know, you can have in mind if you, if you take a simple uh, theoretical model. You know, the, the, this has two consequences. You know, first, uh, uh, you know, the fact that the poorest uh, groups, typically the poorest countries are borrowers, you know, implies that they have less economic autonomy and lower incentives to produce. You know, if you, if you need to repay a big part of what you produce, you know, of course, you will not, you will probably not produce as much. Uh, the other problem is that uh, lenders, you know, fear expropriation and very often, you know, rightly so, you know, if you invest uh, uh, enormous capital equipment in a, in a poor country uh, in, in Africa or South Asia, you know, maybe after the capital investment has been made, uh, you know, you, you, or if you transfer your financial assets to, to, uh, to sovereign funds, uh, you know, in India or in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, 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 and you're supposed to be paid back, you know, there's a risk that you will, uh, that you will be expropriated at some point, which in the real world, you know, explains why lenders, uh, rich countries, lenders, and 
which individuals backed by their rich country government uh, tend to regulate their lending relationship with the poorest, with the poorest economic groups through you know, various uh, uh, coercitive uh, mechanisms, you know, typically uh, colonial and military uh, domination, and you know, also typically organized investment patterns so as to keep control of the most valuable production processes. So here I'm really referring of, you know, there's an enormous literature on, on uh, center periphery relation uh, uh, and, and you know, the, the, the book by Ken Pomerantz, uh, The Great Divergence, and, China versus Europe uh, is, is, of course, very important here. There's a very nice book also by Partha Sarati looking more at the case of India versus Europe. Recent book by Becker and all the new uh, historiography and the new history of capitalism also stresses for you know, the central role of uh, military colonial domination in accounting for the rise of global inequality 1820, 1950. You know, typically what you what you get from this literature is that the share of India and China in world manufacturing uh, output was very big in, in 1800, you know, at least 50, 55 percent of total uh, manufacturing output. And this has virtually disappeared in 1900, you know, less than five percent. And you know what happened in in between, um, uh, you know, is of course very strongly marked by, uh, by uh, you know colonial uh, uh, domination. And, and to view it simply as the as outcome of a spontaneous market uh, process will be extremely naive uh, to say the least. And and so typically, what's going on in the context of colonial empires, but also through in other institutional forms, is that you sometimes have some investment by rich countries in poor countries, but it is done in a way uh, so as to minimize the, the possibility to lose control, basically, uh, to minimize the probability to be expropriated. And this, in practice, is going to put very strong limit to the convergence possibility by, by poor uh, countries. Now, in the, in the more recent period, you know, we actually see a beginning of convergence since 1980. But the thing is that it is very slow, uh, you know, in the sense that between country inequality increased so much during the, the, the colonial era, basically from 1820 uh, or even before until 1960, uh, 1970 in some cases, uh, that, you know, the beginning of the decline that has happened since 1980, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's only, uh, you know, it's, it's, in a way it's only the beginning and, you know, this is a long-term process, this is taking a lot of time. And, you know, there's also a risk that new economic powers like China, of course, will also create their own center-periphery relation with poorer countries in, 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 in South Asia in Africa, and which will also limit the, the uh, you know, the convergence process. So, how, you know, what would be the different institutional setting that will change really the, the conclusion that we find in this paper? You know, that's, of course, a very big question, which, you know, we are not going to be able to, to fully answer today. But let me simply mention that if we really want to accelerate the process, you know, one will need much bigger investment in human and physical capital in the global south, uh, together with greater reliance on self-government, um, uh, so that, you know, individuals and countries have the biggest possible incentives to, to, to produce. Typically, you know, what form could it take? Uh, you know, let's uh, let's be optimistic a little bit. You know, if you had a fraction of global tax revenue on multinationals, billionaires, uh, that would be shared between all countries in proportion to population. Well, even if it is a small fraction, it will make an enormous difference for public investment in education, health, infrastructure in the, in the south. And, you know, I think, you know, we, we had some discussion uh, uh, earlier this year on, on uh, you know, the tax reform from, and the taxation of multinational profits. But, you know, what has been discussed is mostly a way for uh, uh, rich countries and Western countries, you know, to split between themselves, you know, the tax base that is currently located in tax haven. But in the current plan, there will be very little or almost nothing at all going to the, to the south. And, and, you know, I, I don't think this is necessarily the best way to, to prepare ourselves for, for a peaceful future and also you know, to reduce this, this kind of level of global inequality. So, summary and conclusion, uh, you know, this is, uh, in this research, you know, we have built a new data set to study global income inequality in the long run, based on the new wave of historical research on inequality trends. 
we obtain, I think, very suggestive results, you know, persistence of extreme inequality. But, you know, of course, more work is, is required to better understand the drivers of global inequality over, over such a long period. Uh, looking at the dynamics of wealth inequality, and in particular foreign wealth ownership, uh, and not only income inequality is, is very important. Uh, looking at the evolution of material inequality, in particular in carbon, energy consumption, is also uh, uh, an, an you know, a direction in which we, we plan to go in the future uh, in the world inequality database uh, in order to, to better understand this global uh, dynamics. So let me stop there and uh, uh, sorry for the little problem with the slides at the beginning. I hope everything will be fine after that. And Wendy, uh, the, the floor is yours, I think. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. That's uh, uh... Well, you've certainly given us a huge amount of material to, to think about. Um, just let me uh, repeat the rules of the game so everyone can participate. Uh, ask, asking Toma a question, you can either do it through the Q&A or you can do it uh, by um, raising your hand and I, will, um, I can see who has uh, raised their hand and wants to ask a live question. So we have both of these methods, which is challenging for me, but um, I encourage you to come forward with some questions. Okay, so um, the first question from Antonio Afonso is from your figure 13, it seems that inequality decreased after World War II. Is this the case? And if so, why? So yeah, it's great. Actually, I think people are going to want to refer to your slides. <laughs> so it's good to keep them at hand. So the, so the question is, why did inequality uh, decline after World War II? Yeah, that was, that was the question. So this is, uh, you know, I think this is mostly due to the sort of new uh, uh, sort of uh, Keynesian uh, socialist policy. You know, I don't want, I, I don't know how you want to, to call them, but, you know, there, there was certainly, you know, after World War I and World War II, there was suddenly, you know, the development of a new set of social and fiscal institutions. You know, if you think of the rise of progressive taxation, you know, before World War I, uh, you know, the top income tax rate uh, when it existed was uh, very small, you know, less than 10% or 5% in most Western countries. In 1945, you know, it was 91% uh, in the US, uh, what, you know, it was. So, so there was a huge rise in, in tax progressivity. There was most importantly a, a very big increase in, uh, in total uh, social spending, educational spending, uh, uh, health, retirement. And I think, you know, all of this contributed to a compression of inequality from the top. But what's very striking is that, uh, in fact, in terms of growth and capital accumulation, it, it was very positive because there was a lot of compensating uh, capital accumulation coming from the middle class or from the poor or from public investment in the case of education and health. So in, in the end, uh, yeah, you had both a huge compression of inequality from the top, an increase in bottom shares, middle shares, and, and also in, increase in growth in, in, in many countries. Great, thank you. Were thanked for that. Um, I want to. I want to kind of follow up on this <laughs> because um, what I want to kind of push you. I'd rather you went back to four to your favorite figure four. Yep. Um, yep. Okay. So this is. Uh, you know, I think this really is a very useful decomposition of the the between and the within. And so the between is the orange one. Yeah. And and it's so this is very much in tune with what we are now seeing in the sort of um, convergence literature. So Michael Kramer and co-authors and, and so on, um, Easterly and so on, uh, with GDP per capita, talking about what's what's happened since 1990, mainly in what they're finding here in 1980, which is this. Um, we now have absolute convergence, right? And their point is that this is actually uh, absolute convergence, sort of converging to conditional convergence because you find some of the sort of solo fundamentals converging, which is your point really about accumulation and human capital, but extremely slowly, right? Um, but 
the 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 what you at bring to the table as well as you know this confirmation from the income side um, is the within distribution and this really highlights um, and I really want you to, to, to kind of um, come back on this uh, this this extraordinary period um, where we had the the catch-up so this earlier episode of catch-up of convergence of the European countries and and Japan and and so on um, at the same time so this is in the uh, uh, 50s and 60s, as as within inequality went down, right? So we have this coupling of catch up and and narrowing of inequality, and if we just jump forward to this later period where we do have countries kind of springing the middle income trap, they're like jumping out of the middle income trap, but we see the opposite pattern of inequality. We see um, growing inequality. So is this really somehow saying that that this this Western European and, and the former colonies and so on episode is like the real exceptionalism, and that we 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 somehow can't expect to see that combination again of catch up and narrowing of the within distribution? Well, I don't think so. You know, I think all combination are possible. So you know. I, I think there are a number of takeaways from this graph. If you look at this 1980-2020 period, you know, what's striking is first that the, the, the rise of within country inequality is sort of comparable in magnitude, if you want, to the decline in between country inequality. So the two are, are very big. Now, the second thing is that, you know, some people may be tempted to say, well, okay, you know, one is the counterpart of the other. So now we need, we need to have this rise of between country inequality in order to have the decline. And, and this really, I, I, don't, uh, I don't believe it. You know, I think we could have uh, actually an even bigger decline in within country inequality uh, without this increase in, in, in uh, within country inequality. So there is the example, as you said, of, of post-war uh, Western Europe and, and Japan, which we don't quite see here on this graph because this is a global graph, but if you are looking at a graph limited to the, to the rich world, in effect, we will see convergence between country together with uh, within country inequality reduction. Now, if you look at the you know the, if you look at the 19th century, you know this is a period where you have uh, both within and between are rising. So what I what I mean is that, you know generally speaking, you know, the general lesson from this global perspective is that everything uh, you know everything can happen. You know, it depends you know the combination of international and domestic policies. And so the problem is the coupling of the decoupling of the, of the uh, sort of uh, domestic policy regime and international policy regime. So what I mean by this is that in the post-war period and more generally in the 1900-1980 period, you know, you have a domestic policy regime that is becoming pro-redistribution. But the international policy regime is still very much the, 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 you know, the colonial policy regime, to the, so to speak. You know, in, you know, 1930, 1950s, the, the, the biggest time for the British and French colonial empires, and you really need to wait for the 1960, 1970, you know, for a new period to start, uh, sometime, you know, it's uh, very complicated, uh, you know, of course, for the newly independent countries to build a state, and, you know, we, you know as, as soon as they started to build a new state, you know, they entered in the 1970s, 1980s, with all the, the uh, you know, the sort of forced uh, liberalization policy and uh, austerity policy and Washington consensus policy, which I think were not, uh, were not very, uh, are not very uh, useful. So, you know, th th there is some specific policy environment which produces, that's, what, that's my general point. And so in, in the future, you know, I think in fact, as, as I was saying, you know, we could have, if we had more uh, sort of pro-redistribution policy, not only in the West, but, but also, you know, sort of helping, uh, you know, countries in the South to have a more progressive tax system, to have a more, a bigger share of the, of the uh, tax revenue coming from multinationals or world billionaire, you know, this will lead at the same time to, to a reduction of within country inequality and faster convergence. Uh, 
convergence, as you mentioned, is, is slow. Well, it depends, you know, the, the orange curve, you know, between 1980 and 2020 is going down pretty fast, you know, in a way it's quite spectacular. But as compared to the, to the, to the enormous, uh, you know, uh, level of, of, of between country inequalities that has built between 1820 and 1980, indeed, you know, this, if we just continue at this reason, it will take a long time. And as we all know, you know, we've seen what happened uh, in Afghanistan uh, very recently, uh, you know, the, the process of state construction uh, is, is, is uh, you know, can be very complicated, you know, in Mali or in Afghanistan. Uh, or, and, and so China was successful uh, through its own way of sort of building a state, investing in infrastructure, health education with a big uh, cost in terms of political uh, repression, as we know. Uh, how, how is this going to happen for weaker, uh, countries with weaker government. Uh, again, I think the issue of uh, sharing of fiscal revenue and in particular fiscal revenue from multinationals, which is a big uh, sort of policy topic uh, uh, of 2021 and, 20, and, and I think the coming years, uh, I, I think is very really key if we want to, to accelerate this, this process. Thank, thank you. Um, and I guess your your kind of coda to that would be that since we don't we 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 don't have uh, much time either now or uh, in the big scheme of things in terms of climate, the, there's a kind of call for action in what you're saying. So let me um, bring bring things to a close and thank everyone for for coming. Um, uh, we, we know where to go in, in, in terms of getting hold of the data uh, and we can all um, push, uh, push this, uh, this agenda in the scientific sense. Um, uh, thanks to the, the, you know, everyone's collaboration and providing that, um, all of the data and code and so on uh, for us and our students. So thank you, Tom. Thank you for the lecture and thank you for the fantastic contribution um, in terms of this uh, wonderful database. So, uh, uh, some someone else asked a question, but I think we'll I'll pass that on to Thomas, and we should bring things to a close. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Okay, thanks a lot.